Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I turn the lights. Yeah, we're doing the lights down. That's right. Good morning. Good morning. Here we are. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, are, are we all right as far as sound is concerned? Everything is fine. Thank you so much. Can I just remind you about cell phones, if you would? Thank you so much. Well, it's good to see you all again. I must say, this gets more and more intimidating every day. I don't sure we're having people hanging from the rafters tomorrow. So I'm <laughs> not quite sure how I'm going to handle that. <laughs> anyway, it's good to see you all, and thank you for coming. After yesterday's grand tour of 1,500 years of Western civilization, today we're going to cone in our focus on the man who changed portraiture forever. And you remember my criteria for this course what makes an artist great is that you have to change the subsequent course of art history, and I think without question Rembrandt did, as we will see. So Rembrandt van uh, Hermansen van Rijn, widely held to be the greatest artist of his time. In fact, the greatest artist of all time in the eyes of many. Yet, during his lifetime, he was largely ignored because his paintings were often dark and his characters, often himself, would loom out of the darkness into the half-light. Furthermore, however tender the subject of his painting, he was criticised in later life for the roughness of the way he painted because at the time it was expected that all paintings would be smooth and glossy. And so he was a man really living on his own, in his own world, respectful of what was required of him, but true to himself, as we will see. To fully understand Rembrandt and his painting, we have to understand the time and the, the political and religious times in which he lived. He was born in Leiden, the second city of the Dutch Republic, as it became, in 1606. For the preceding, much of the preceding century, the Netherlands was a Dutch province of the Spanish strictly Orthodox Catholic dynasty, the Habsburgs. So it was part of Spanish Habsburg, which extended to the west, uh, to Naples there, and Sicily and Sardinia, as you can see, whereas the eastern branch of the Habsburg family was based in Austria, in uh, Vienna, and was responsible, the domain was much of uh, Eastern Europe. But then it came about, in about 1560, that as a result of religious oppression of the Protestant majority in the, in the uh, Spanish Netherlands who lived in the north of the country and high taxation that there was a move to in, for independence in that part of the country. The north was not only Protestant but it was also poor compared to the southern part of the Spanish Netherlands uh, which was much more prosperous. And in 1560, rebellion was started, which when, went on for smouldering on for some 80 years, culminating in 1581 in the establishment under William of Orange of the Dutch Republic, independent of the Habsburg South. The seven states, the seven provinces of Holland, therefore, became the Dutch Republic and with that came a migration of people from the south. This was now an independent state, Protestant by religion, and as a consequence of that establishment, the Protestants from the south, numbering some 10,000, came up to infuse the population of the north, bringing with them a strong work ethic. There were academics among them, there were traders, um, there were strict, skilled artisans, and so there was a population base that was skilled and motivated to succeed. And these were augmented by the Huguenots coming from France, who settled in the new Dutch Republic, together with Jews from Portugal. And so this was a mixture, and it was not long before these people 
took advantage of their geographical situation on the North Sea, which was between the Baltic states to the north, Poland to the east, France, Spain, and Germ uh, France, Spain, and Portugal to the south. And so it was incumbent upon them to become traders whereby they could transport things like minerals, timber, um, wine, salt, from the, and grain from these countries from one to another. So the main economy of the early Dutch Republic was as trading, and as a consequence of trading by sea, shipbuilding became a major industry. And as the Dutch merchant marine enlarged, so the Dutch navy was established Military ships were built, naval ships were built in order to protect the fleet. <coughs> Trading from one country to another, transporting these goods, was the means of income, but the savvy Dutch were always sure that their own storehouses were well filled. In 1602, the Dutch East India Company received a monopoly for trade with the Far East. And with that, they were bringing silks and spices, which were much in demand in Europe, and holding the monopoly for that, the wealth of the Dutch Republic grew, and before long, it was entering its golden age. The Dutch East India Company issued bonds for its own expansion and shipbuilding, which it sold to the public. And by default, the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company in Amsterdam became the world's first stock exchange. Leiden itself was situated on the estuary of the River Rhine, from which the family, Rembrandt, Harmenzoon, van Rijn, took their name. The Rhine opened up into the North Sea, with many little branches going out into the ocean, one of which ran through, at the time, this map of the medieval city of Leiden. Leiden had outgrown its medieval city walls by the time Rembrandt was born in 1606, but nonetheless was a very wealthy, tr wealthy city based on textile. The textiles were made from wool, which the ships imported from Britain, woven into textiles, and then the tributaries of the Rhine allowed the finished textiles to be transported to Germany. And so the, the, the city was really thriving uh, on that basis. The religious... Calvinist ethic of the town was very much reflected in the way the citizens dressed. Anyone who was aspiring to be a citizen of some note was obliged to wear the strict Calvinist dress which was all in black with a lace white collar and white cuffs. And here we can see a few such individuals gathering in the forecourt of the University of Leiden founded by William of Orange and still today the most prestigious university in Holland. And here we see these citizens mixing with uh, some ordinary people. The fan Rembrandt's family was a large one. He was the eighth of ten children. His father was a well-to-do miller of barley. They lived in a three-story brick house next to the mill, and the barley that he milled was then sold to the brewers who made beer, for beer was the staple drink of the city at the time. He was a bright boy, uh, Rembrandt, and he was sent to what was called in the day a Latin school, which groomed its pupils for the church, uh, for the law, and for the diplomatic service. At the age of 14, there is a record to show that Rembrandt was a enrolled in the Leiden University. But there the record stops and there's no evidence that he actually attended any courses. What we do know is that 14, he was apprenticed to Leiden's leading painter at the time, Jakob von Swannenberg. Where Rembrandt got any idea from, to be a painter from, demonstrating any skill as a, as a drawer or as an artist, there is no record, so we don't know where this came from. But at the age of 14, he served an apprenticeship for four years with Swannenpool. Just before that point, this is his mother. I should just mention that his mother, etched here by Rembrandt when she was 60 years old, was from a family of bakers. And interestingly, 
her family were Catholic, yet all ten children were baptised in the Protestant faith. And so here, Rembrandt is now starting his apprenticeship with Jakob von Swanenberg, and as you can see from this picture, painting of his, of, of von Swanenberg's, this man was clearly locked in a time warp with Hieronymus Bosch. <laughs> There seems to be no evidence that Svonsvonenberg had any influence on Rembrandt's art other than teaching him how to grind paint and prime canvases. Svonsvonenberg recognised, though, that the boy had some talent and he arranged for him to spend six months in his last year of his apprenticeship in Amsterdam with the leading painter of the time, Peter Lastman. And as you can see, Lastman was very much into what was expected of a painter of any note at the time, religious or mythical history painting. And this is an example of Lastman's work. And there he spent six months, and at the end of that time, the young Rembrandt felt confident enough to return to Leiden and set himself up as an independent painter. This is his first major oil painting, which portrays the king of the Batavians. The Batavians were held to be the tribe, the forerunners of the modern Dutch people. And so this was historically a very important figure and a very important scenario for him to present his credentials as a history painter. And you can see that he respects uh, what he had learnt from Lastman but the end result, there's the king of the Batavians and there are his soldiers and citizenry. I think we would have to admit for all the intention and endeavour here, it's a picture painting that doesn't really succeed. It's a little too cluttered, I think you would agree, and the individual figures are decidedly wooden. But for an 18-year-old, I don't think one could argue. But he was a quick learner, and within months... He does this small panel painting of Jesus driving the money changers from the temple. And there is a very ordinary looking Jesus, a citizen with his hair all unkempt, driving them away. And it seems to me, looking at the expressions of the money changers, rather than a finished painting, this was a study in order that he could portray in oils different facial expressions. The fact that Jesus here looks so ordinary is absolutely emblematic of Rembrandt's life view. He was a man of the people, and as we will see, almost everything he did respected the common man. What a quick learner. A few months later, he suddenly finds himself in this painting here of Anne being denounced, uh, falsely accused of stealing a kid. And as we look at this, this looks like a mature work, I think, if ever there was one. We can see Tobit sitting there in tattered splendor. Tobit is a figure from one of the minor books of the Bible. And in this, he's a God-fearing man, as you can see the way he's clasped his hands, but he's blind. You can see his eyes are opaque with cataract. And there he is accusing his wife. He could hear the kid bleating and he accused her falsely of uh, stealing the kid, and there she is berating him for this false accusation. So it's a little bit of a genre painting, if you like. It's historical insofar as it relates to a figure in the Bible, but all in all, it's hugely accomplished, given where he was coming from with the Batavians just six months earlier. And here is his first self-portrait. A small panel painting... He was to do some 60 or 70 self-portraits in various forms. And this is the earliest one. And we see a little diminutive figure, because he wasn't a, very, a man of much stature. A diminutive figure as a youth here, 18 years old, dressed up against the cold of the studio, wrapped up in a blue and gold outfit. In one hand, his palette, and the other, his uh, brushes. And what is so remarkable about this painting, he doesn't paint himself. It's a self-portrait, but he doesn't paint himself front and centre. He's retiring in the shadow in the background there. What is front and centre is the easel. And on the easel is a canvas. We don't see what's on the canvas. It's a blank canvas at this stage. 
And what this painting conveys to me is what is painted. It's not self-portrait of Rembrandt, but in indicating that it is not the artist who is important, but the arts. And so here he's coming uh, from this place. Let me draw your attention to a couple of little details, though. Look at the floor, the way it is scuffed there. Can you see? And look at the, 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 the plaster on the wall on the right side there, behind the easel. Can you see how it's separated away and the interior is beginning to crumble? And again, the door on the right-hand side there with the cracks above it. Indicating early on, at the 18, age of 18, Rembrandt's awareness of the transience of life and the effect of decay of time. And this will feature in all his work. While he was working with Lassman in Amsterdam, he was working with the young man, Jan Lieven, a year younger than Rembrandt, but highly ambitious. And when Rembrandt went back to Leiden at the age of 18 to set himself up as an independent painter, he went with, Le with Lieven and the two of them shared a studio. Lieven, very accomplished, 17 years old, paints this portrait of Rembrandt. Can you see their full face in the light there? Hugely accomplished. Rembrandt, let me just go back one, Lieven painted this and the two of them were working together quite happily and then out of the blue there comes a knock at the door of the studio and this is Konstantin Huygens who is the secretary to the Prince of Orange. The reputation of these two young men had travelled from Amsterdam where they had been working with Lastman to the Prince of Orange's court. Why had Huygens come to seek them out, two youngsters, 18 years old? Because south of the border, in Catholic Spanish Netherlands, in Antwerp, was Rubens. And Rubens was achieving great fame, not only in the Netherlands, but throughout Europe. And the court in the northern Protestant Dutch Republic which was trying to find a painter who, in the fullness of time, would rival Rubens. And so they came to seek out these two young men whose reputations clearly had travelled ahead of them. Huygens made a note after seeing these two boys, and he said, well, they're certainly full of themselves, which I thought was interesting. But he made a very succinct observation that of the two, he thought Rembrandt was the better at portraying character whereas Lieven was better at composition. He then commissions a portrait from one of them. And to Rembrandt's chagrin, it is Lieven's who wins the portrait. That having been done, Rembrandt demonstrates to himself that he is indeed a portrait painter of some note. And here is the 18-year-old Rembrandt self-portrait. Below his collar, you can, below his silk scarf there, you can see a gorget, the metal collar worn by knights. So here he's seeing himself as a knight. And this em enveloping himself in costumes, which we will see later on, was not for vanity. It was so that he could inhabit the person whose costume he was wearing. And here he sees himself as a knight. That same, if we just look for a moment there, you can see how he's got one face, one half of his face in light and the other in shadow. And this adds to his allure, he thought. And this chiaroscuro had come from Italy just a few decades before, from Caravaggio. And here Caravaggio has used the lighting, the so-called chiaroscuro, light and dark on the same canvas, depicting here the ecstasy of St. Francis. But Caravaggio uses it as a dramatic theatrical spotlight shining on the protagonist. Rembrandt uses it in a much more subtle way. Here, he paints the supper at Emmaus. And you remember from the story from St. Luke that two uh, disciples of Jesus were sitting in their hut having supper when suddenly they saw Jesus entering and sitting down to join them at the meal. 
And what was so staggering was not only that event, but the fact that this took place three days after Jesus' entombment. And as they blinked in disbelief at what they were seeing, the image of Jesus faded away. And here Rembrandt has done what I think is the impossible, to paint a fading image. How much more subtle than Caravaggio. And again here, two scholars disputing is what he calls this painting. The two scholars are in fact St. Paul facing us in the blue garment there with his full beard facing us mostly in the light, disputing with St. Peter. And why has he put those two together? Because St. Paul was open-minded. And here he's pointing to a Bible on the lap of St. Peter, who is more orthodox, pointing out a passage in the Bible open to perhaps an alternative interpretation. And perhaps this is why St. Paul is the patron saint of the Anglican Church, and St. Peter is the dominant saint of the Catholic Church, reformism, questioning, and orthodoxy. But what about the use of light? Here Rembrandt has not spotlit one individual, although Peter, Paul gets the better part of the light. The light here falls to the side, and what is illuminated is the space between them. In other words, in the same way that we saw Jesus disappearing as an image, here Rembrandt is painting the thoughts, the discussion, the debate that is going on between these two men. It's the, it's the idea that he likes, not the individuals. And again, Jeremiah lamenting Jerusalem, perhaps his most moving picture to date. And here we can see Jeremiah surrounded by some of the vessels from Jerusalem that have been uh, rescued. The burning fire on the left there, just out of the picture, indicating the destruction of the city. And there's Jeremiah, the light falling on his head, not his face, but on his bald head and to the side. Again, what is illuminated is not Jeremiah, the prophet, but he's illuminating here the mourning for the loss of the city. And now here we see Rembrandt feeling a little more self-confidence, and he's now dressed himself in his costume. You can see there the, the berry and the feather, and he now wears a gold chain as an established painter and an established citizen, not a, just a jobbing painter. Etching was a very important part of Rembrandt's life. In fact, he regarded it every bit as important as his oil painting. And here he uses etching early on in his career as a means of looking for different facial expressions. He did perhaps two or three dozen of these sketches in different ways, and here he's just showing us a frown. And here you can see a startled look of surprise. He was self-taught as an etcher, and as we'll see a little later on, some of his works were so magnificent as to surpass the real master at the time, um, uh, Albrecht Dürer. Around this time, his father died, and he felt that he was sufficiently accomplished as a painter to move to Amsterdam to have a career as a portrait painter. And just before he did, perhaps one of this is commemorating the death of his father, it's a study of an old man. We don't know who it is. But you can see the skill which he's developed in a very short time as a portrait painter. He arrives in Amsterdam, at the age of 24, having spent his first 24 years in Leiden, apart from the time he spent in Amsterdam uh, with his uh, teacher there for six months. And he found Amsterdam to be a thriving, wealthy, dynamic town, very open intellectually and tolerant religiously. It was a town in, under continuous construction, built in a series of semicircular canals, as you can see there, on either side of which were grand houses to accommodate the captains of commerce, many of whom were keen to have their portraits painted. 
His reputation from Leiden had reached a dealer in Amsterdam, and the dealer there, um, Jacob von Uhlenberg, was happy to invite Rembrandt, knowing he was coming to Amsterdam, as a lodger in his house. And there, Uhlenberg in, in, introduced him to some of his clients, and there he was able to get going as a portrait painter. He starts cautiously, like this. A young man, we don't know who he is, wearing typical uh, dress there of a strict uh, Calvinist. We don't know who he is, looking up a little bit surprised. And this is an early, cautious commercial portrait that uh, Rembrandt is drawing. And Uhlenberg says to him, there are lots of portrait painters in Amsterdam. There's a much demand. You will succeed. But I advise you, like Michelangelo and Raphael, not to sign your paintings, are Roman Hermann Soon von Rhein, but just sign them Rembrandt. And there he elevates his status. It seemed to work. For here now, we see uh, a portrait of uh, Nicholas Butts, his first really wealthy client. And as you can guess from the sable that lines his sleeve and down the lapels there of his gown that he's wearing, uh, this is a wealthy farrier. And there he's a man who's self-assured, as you can see. And Rembrandt depicts him with his moustache and beard so neatly trimmed, his fur hat as well. A man who knows his stuff, a man of business, a man of substance, a man of self-confidence to judge by the way he puts his hand, you see, on the back of the chair there, intruding into our space. He doesn't mind if he comes a bit forward uh, towards you. As well as individual portraits, of course, there is a demand in the city of Amsterdam for group portraits for the guilds. There were many trade guilds. All trades had their own guild, and the guild members wanted to have their portraits painted. And so here was a lucrative, another potential lucrative source of income for Rembrandt was paint, the group portrait. And this commission came from the Guild of Surgeons. And there we see Klaus Peterson, who was a private practice physician in his black hat and gown there, a private practice physician who also did part-time anatomical demonstrations here. In order to further his private practice as a physician, he hung outside his house a wooden sign with a tulip on it. And so he was known in the community as Dr. Taup, but that wasn't his real name. Here he stands demonstrating with a pair of forceps in his hand there, you can see, and he's picking up the dissected forearm of this cadaver and he's picking it up so that the hand muscles, the flexor muscles on the only aspect of the forearm, contract. And in doing so, as he's gesturing there with his left hand to the right of the screen, the fingers curl. And so Dr. Taut slash Peterson is demonstrating the effect of these muscles. And among the many artifacts that Rembrandt had in his cabinet of curiosities was indeed a dissected forearm uh, that remained there uh, for much of his life. No, no problem. And there he's, this, is a, this is a contrived image, if you like, in order to benefit the portrait, individual portraits of the member, senior members of the guild, because real anatomical dissections weren't done in a setting like this, of course, and there was a certain protocol and the order of dissection, and the limbs were the very last thing uh, to be dissected. But nonetheless, it was a huge success. And why it was a huge success was that it was huge in size. It was eight feet wide and six feet tall. And the members of the guild were absolutely thrilled with it, and it was put in pride of place in their main hall. His, re his reputation was now made. Not yet. He was just 26 years old, and now he paints himself having successfully pleased the Guild of Surgeons with this self-portrait. A self-assured young man. It's curious how young he looks, doesn't it? I mean, he looks like a 12-year-old a there, 26 years old. Now he's got a little moustache, I suppose, to make himself seem a little older, and a few little wispy hairs under his uh, lower lip there, dressed with his black hat and a lace collar 
in the black formal outfit, a painter who has indeed arrived. But to really arrive, you must do history painting. It keeps coming back to that, and it's a pain for somebody like Rembrandt, but to succeed and earn a, a, a reputation, he has to do that. And so now he paints, looking over his shoulder across the border to Antwerp, what Rubens is doing, who is the master of history painting. Rembrandt does his own history painting for the first time here, other than the Batavians, which wasn't a success. And here he portrays Jesus on the Sea of Galilee in a storm. And there you can see Jesus at the back of the boat there, just in front of the stern oarsman, sitting calm because he knows all will be well, while everybody else is holding on for dear life as the boat is battered by the wind and the waves. He now gets a commission, the most prestigious commission of his career to date, after the Guild of Surgeons, and that is the order comes from the secretary to the Prince of Orange, this is the High Court of the Dutch Republic, for a series of paintings of the uh, crucifixion, entombment and resurrection of Christ. Well, a very powerful commission. And again, Rembrandt turns to Rubens to the south for inspiration. And here is Rem Rubens's version of Christ being taken down from the cross, surrounded by figures all lamenting, grasping, and the light on the body of the dead Christ, poignant if ever there was. A hugely successful painting, I'm sure you will agree. But Rembrandt's got a problem. Rubens was painting for the Catholic Church and for the Catholic aesthetic which was allowing for this sort of exuberance as a means of demonstrating the faith. Whereas the Protestant ethic was different, more restrained, more reserved. And Rembrandt knew that in order to sell his religious paintings, he had to respect that uh, sensitivity. And so now Rembrandt does his own version of the descent from the cross. And here it is, sad, limp and deflated, I think we would have to say, certainly in comparison to the Rubens. And he did several others of the same series, all of which were, he just couldn't get his head around this problem of how to represent something in a subdued manner, yet what was a successful painting. And he knew that this was unsuccessful. So he stuck to what he knew and that, of course, uh, was his portraiture. And now he does a portrait of the patron of the Calvinist reform movement, Johannes Wurtenbogert. He was a kindly, thoughtful, philosoph philosophical scholar who was leading the reform movement of the Calvinists. And you can see here he's got a soft face, and can you see his red-rimmed eyes tired from all his reading, with his hand on his heart. But Rembrandt had a problem now, because the reform movement was beginning to take hold, which meant a relaxation of the strict code of public conduct of the Calvinist. Gone, or going, was the strict black garb and the white collar and the white cuffs, and people were now feeling more comfortable dressing a little more exuberantly, shall we say. And who was there to exploit that than Franz Hals, working in Harlem, and now Rembrandt's client base was now diminishing as people were drifting towards Franz Hals, who was now very expert at painting exuberant costumes which the reformed Calvinists now felt permitted to wear. Furthermore, there was Anthony van Dyck, dashing and itinerant, who had trained with Rubens in Antwerp and saw him as Rubens' natural successor, but now working in Britain and working in the Dutch Republic. And his speciality was painting ladies as ladies of great distinction society as classical beauties. And look at the care with which, which Van Dyck has lavished on the costume here 
and the sleeves, the puffed sleeves, the hair and everything else. And so naturally with the restrictions lifted, Rembrandt's client base was now diminishing even further. And that left him with only one choice. He still had a loyal following among the strict Calvinists and the even stricter Mennonites who wore black likewise. And because they were wearing black and he painted them largely against the black background, he had really no choice but to concentrate on their face. And here we see an old lady weary with her years, heavy lips, heavy, as you can see, eyebrows likewise. And so now, through default, through necessity, Rembrandt was a painter of the face. But now he cheered himself up a little bit because Uhlenberg, with whom he was staying, the dealer, had a niece. This niece had recently been orphaned. Her father had been a mayor and a lawyer and mayor of a small town in the northern part of the Dutch Republic. And he had recently died, her mother having died several years previously. And she was 21 years old and very pretty. And she came to visit Uhlenberg where Rembrandt was staying. And he became immediately besotted by her. So much so that he did this silver point paint drawing of her. And you can see there she is, a pretty girl with a wide brim hat, garlanded with flowers, looking wistful, her head resting against her hand there. And underneath what he wrote, will take <laughs> it blew me away, as it's, sure it's going to blow you away, he wrote, this is a portrait of my wife, Saskia, <laughs> on the third day of our betrothal. He'd only met her three days before. <laughs> on the third day of our betrothal, the 8th of June, 1633. A year later, they were married, and this was the love of his life. He painted her many times, and here is Saskia uh, as Flora, the goddess of spring. Interestingly, he always painted her fully clothed. And here he's painted her, look at the detail where she's lavished on the wool and silk garment that she's wearing. And in this picture, she's heavily pregnant. And she will shortly give birth to their first son, Rombertus. And Rombertus would die at the age of two months. A year later, she was pregnant again, having put on a lot of weight, as you can see. Again as Flora. And she will give birth this time to a daughter. And the daughter will die at the age of three weeks. Nonetheless, he felt that he'd earned enough money as a portrait painter and he was getting commissions coming in, the Guild of Surgeons, from important people in the town. He'd made sufficient money to cons console Sakia by moving from their modest premises to a grand three-story house on St. Antonin Breestraat in Amsterdam, which is today housing the Amsterdam Museum, which you may, the Rembrandt Museum you may have visited. Feeling confident, he now feels he has to establish his credentials once and for all as a history painter. He clearly got it all wrong with the entombment um, and the descent from the cross, as you saw. But he's determined to make a go as a history painter. And here he depicts something from Greek mythology, the story of Ganymede. Ganymede was the handsome young son, in fact, exquisitely handsome young son, of a king of Troy. And in traditional storytelling, Zeus, living on Mount Olympus, spied him from afar in Troy. It's quite a long way from Olympus to Troy. But he spied him, changed himself into an eagle, swooped down, gathered the young man up, and brought him back to Mount Olympus, where he made him a demigod. Well, all the images, it's a popular image for history painters, and there are a dozen examples of Ganymede in the history of art. But look what Rembrandt does. He doesn't depict him as a golden-haired youth, as servant of Zeus. He depicts him as a squalling baby, doing his best he can to squirm around to get out of the grasp of this eagle, which is grabbing him painfully, so much so that he's urinating in the process, as you can see there. <laughs> Again, Rembrandt, the humanity of Rembrandt, the everyday person, as we all see. Another subject for history painting, then, he has to find something else. And here's Rubens's 
depiction of Prometheus. And Prometheus, you may recall, had offended Zeus and as a consequence of that was punished by being chained to a rock and having his liver pecked out by an eagle. The liver then regenerating, the eagle pecking more, and this torture would go on indefinitely. And here's Rubin's depiction of that, the eagle with the spread wings that you can see. And you can see the head there of Prometheus owling in pain there as the talons of the eagle grasp his forehead. What a powerful painting. Rem, Rubin, Rembrandt uses this as inspiration for his next history painting, which is The Blinding of Samson. And here's Samson, lying horizontally there, his face and his beard having been cut off, thereby reducing his strength, and a sword advancing towards him, and somebody now, can you see this armoured man with a, with a knife gouging out his right eye? Well, what a powerful, I mean a horrific image, if ever there was one. But how disappointing it is. Spotlit, yes. But there's so much going on. So many figures, even though his head is right towards us, unlike Prometheus, where you feel the pain and you can see what's going on, it's all focused. Here it's so diffuse as to, I have to say, not successful. And I think Rembrandt appreciated that as well. So he tries again, this time with Balthazar. Remember the story of uh, Balthazar, the Babylonian king, who had sacked the, the temple in Jerusalem and proclaimed himself as powerful, if not more powerful than God himself. And then the finger on the wall writes the words warning Balthazar that his days are numbered. And though this has been cut down from its original dimensions, again we run into the same problem that we ran into with Samson. There are so many things going on here, we're not sure where to look. Do we look at Balthazar? Yes, I think we do. But then do we look at the writing on the wall? Yes, we do. Somehow it's a, sort of, it's a little bit too diffuse to be entirely satisfactory. All this is heresy for art historians. But let me tell you, this is my response to this. And I think I'll leave it up to you whether you agree or not. Hebrew writing, as you know, is written horizontally from right to left. But in this particular image, Rembrandt has used Hebrew writing going from top line down vertically from right to left. And for that he sought the help of a neighbour of his, Menachem ben Israel, who was a rabbinical scholar and, a, and an authority on Kabbalah. And I suspect there's been much discussion as to what those Hebrew letters actually mean and nobody can quite agree and it's almost certainly some Kabbalistic convoluted interpretation uh, but nonetheless the message is clear that God was not pleased with Balthazar. The Jewish population of Amsterdam numbered probably only, ten, uh, only a thousand or so souls and these were divided largely into two communities. The smaller was the Ashkenazi Jewish community that had come from Eastern Europe and they could be, dis they were usually poor, they were peddlers, bakers, butchers, living in small wooden houses, worshipping in small rooms in their wooden houses as informal synagogues, quite unlike the one represented in this painting, which would be much too grand. But nonetheless, they could usually be recognised in the street, most of them wore beards, and many of them wore medieval costume that distinguished them. By far the majority of the Jews in Amsterdam at the time were the Sephardi Jews who had left Spain and Portugal for following the Inquisition a hundred years earlier. And they had integrated themselves, they were cultured, they um, counted among their number uh, writers, lecturers, um, shippers, as well as traders uh, and lawyers and doctors. And shortly after Rembrandt's death, they had established themselves sufficiently well to build the magnificent Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam, which you may have seen and still hold services today. And in their manner and in their dress, they were indistinguishable from other Amsterdamers. And here, a neighbour of Rembrandt's was Dr. Uh, Dr. Ephraim Bonus. 
And here he does an etching of him, uh, very sensitively done, and you can see that the skills that Rembrandt is developing in etching are moving apace. And that same Savardi Jewish community would, in the next generation, produce the leading philosopher of the day, Baruch Spinoza. And Spinoza's humanistic interpretation of Judaism rang true with Rembrandt, although they were not synchronous in time. Spinoza was a little after Rembrandt, but nonetheless they shared the same spirit of humanism. And as we see in much of the work of Rembrandt, he is very much concerned with the outcasts of society. And here is an etching of Rembrandt. You can see of a beggar woman with a child on her back there, begging for alms at the door there. And here another of a cripple hobbling along on a wooden leg with the aid of a stick. And here, most movingly of all, which I think absolutely encapsulates the humanism of Rembrandt, which we saw in Jesus, the everyman, expelling the money changers from the temple in that small panel early on in his career, now we see the Holy Family Rembrandt style. There is Joseph, the carpenter, at the back there with his carpenter's tools working away. And there is Mary wearing simple clothes, looking up from her book, attending her child who's stirred in his grip and she leans forward to see that he's all right. And if it weren't for the angels hovering over in the top left there, this will be just every man, every woman's vision. Every woman would have experienced exactly such a scene. Anyway, portraits, self-portraits constantly occur, occur. And here is Titian's famous portrait here of uh, Ludovico Ariosto, the, the Italian poet, painted by Titian, the man with the quilted sleeve in the National Gallery in London, which you may have seen. And Rembrandt has a go at that as well. Same sort of posture. I, not to say I'm as good as Titian. This is for private consumption. He just does this, but he adopts that particular posture. But now he is feeling self-confident. Not only does he depict himself with a gold chain, he wears now two gold chains uh, and a fur collar. As well as the guilds, as well as the private people asking for portraits, there were also the militias. The militias played a very important role at the time of the Dutch Republic, when the Dutch Republic was getting established, fighting its war of independence from the Spanish South. <coughs> They were, their primary task was to guard the frontier as, as, as the forces fought. But now, in Rembrandt's time, the militias were almost entirely ceremonial. Citizenry, they were armed. And it was like a club, I suppose, um, and they wanted to have their portraits painted. And here's a very typical militia uh, portrait uh, painted by Thomas Kaiser. Everyone's crowding in because they all want to see their own face uh, portrayed there and you get paid as a portrait painter, a group portrait, by the number of people you managed to cram in, so Kaiser did pretty well out of this. But as some wit put it, you could just imagine a soldier with a large sword taking a mighty swipe, starting on one side, and slicing off all their heads in one go. <laughs> Rembrandt's take on the militia was different. And you can see how different. The white lines there represent the current dimensions of the picture, but this is actually how the original picture was before it was cut up. And you can see it's full of action. There are 16 identifiable militiamen, and this is the uh, militia, of course, of uh, Franz Banning Cock. And there is the captain, Franz Banning Cock, standing there in the center there with his black outfit, his red sash of his rank there, about to stride out. This has been known for many years as the night watch. But there's nothing of the sort, because if you have a look, you can see there is light streaming in from a door that has been opened, throwing shadows behind. And in fact, they're about to stride out into the daylight, but it's difficult to get away from the night watch as a name for that. To indicate that the militias had now become like a sort of rotary club, if you like, not uh, respect to Rotarians, please. <laughs> uh, they've dressed up in fancy dress here. And there is uh, uh, Banning uh, Cox 
lieutenant, all in gold. I'm not sure that's appropriate for going out to do militia duties, but there he is ceremonially dressed up with this strange white cummerbund around his chest there, the purpose of which quite defeats me. But it's an item of interest, and no doubt that's what happened. But it's absolutely crammed full. Not only are their heads not all arranged in a row, but it's crammed full of lots of little vignettes, full of interest. Do you see the man on the left there in red, loading powder into his musket? And there on the right-hand side there, we can see the drummer practicing a role. Other little activities going on. And there, just to the left of the screen there of, of Banning Cock himself, two children who've come in to wish their fathers well as they go off on a ceremonial parade. So, completely different concept. And here another guild, this time of the Drapers, want to have their portraits uh, portrayed. And these are the so-called syndics of the Drapers Guild. The syndic role was to evaluate each bale of cloth as it came in for quality, and then they would price it accordingly. And so they had a very responsible job, and they were looked up to because textiles were an important part of Amsterdam economy. And here Rembrandt paints them not all in a row, as you might expect, but he paints them from low down. Can you see we're much lower than they are? They're on a dais. Furthermore, their table, covered by a cloth, projects into our space. So we are intruders in their space. Not only are we intruders, we've interrupted them from their deliberations. And all of them turn round to stare at us to find, who it, find out who it is who's actually come in to disturb them. Always something going on in his head, way beyond the actual brief of doing a group portrait. Saskia now was ill. And as a consequence of that, darkness began to appear in Rembrandt's pictures. Here he depicts two dead game birds. One oozing blood, which is dripping onto the floor there, you can see. And Saskia did not seem to be getting any better. And thinking back to their personal family life together, it had been one of unremitting tragedy. After all, they had lost Rombertus, who was named for Saskia's late father at the age of two months. They had lost Cornelia, the first-born girl. And then she was pregnant yet again with this another girl, also called Cornelia, who also died within the first three weeks of life. Three children that never were. And now she's pregnant, although ill, with their fourth child, which will be the only survivor, their son Titus. Death begins to appear in other works of Rembrandt. Here we can see a young couple standing by an open grave where a skeleton is becking them in, showing them an hourglass where the sand has almost run out. And significantly, although she has her back to us, she's wearing Saskia's hat at their betrothal, her betrothal drawing. And as she grew iller and iller, almost certainly from tuberculosis, she became wasted, sunken cheeked, flushed, eyes, starting black, he realised the end was near. And then she dies at the age of just 29. They'd been married eight years. A year later, he paints this memorial portrait of her, dressed up as a Renaissance noblewoman, because that's how he viewed her. Her hat, velvet, costume beautifully portrayed in profile, Profile was significant because that was the way you portrayed kings. That's why kings' heads of state portraits are in profile on coins. So he painted her, and this was the one love of his life. He was now left at the age of 36 with Titus. He was 35 years old when she died, and now he had a nine-month-old boy, Titus, to look after. So he engages a nurse to look after him, and this nurse is Gertie Dix. She was a widow from the north of the country, and apart from nursing duties, before long she became his mistress, and they were in bed. And here she is holding aside the curtains, and he paints her. And unlike Saskia, we see her naked. And here she is as Danae. Danae was the daughter of a Greek god who was inseminated by Zeus, according to the story. And here we see the humanity of Rembrandt. He paints her not as some idealised, ivory-skinned beauty, as the great Renaissance painters would have done so, 
but paints her as an ordinary woman who is holding her hand up, we're not quite sure why, 